Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We're looking at the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified his angel unto his servant John. Now look at verse 4 to 6. That's instructive. That's doctrine. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead 
and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Now take note, the Jesus he is about to unveil here is not the incarnate Christ. It's not Jesus of Nazareth. It's not Jesus, the son of Mary. He already emphatically told you that the Jesus is going to unveil here is the first begotten of the dead. What, which means this book of Revelation rallies around the risen Lord. Now watch what his resurrection has done to us. Now take note of the tenses. He has loved us and washed us from our sins. So we are loved by him. And as a result of his sacrificial work, which was demonstrated in his love, we are washed. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet seen as Christ died for us. So the demonstration of God's love is that he died so we can be washed. And half as a result of his sacrificial work. So if you pay attention to the tenses, he's dealing with the past tense of God's word or the finished work of Christ hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We have already established that in studying the book of Revelation, you know, uh, the moment we begin to see the visions, the utterances, and the interaction with angels. Because it's a book of metaphors, symbols, imageries, and it's the book of visions. All right? So the moment we begin to see visions, utterances, interactions with angels contradicting the written world, we are supposed to discard them. Anything that contradicts the written world that comes from visions, revelations. In fact, let me add this one because this is what many of us experience sometimes. Dreams, visions, revelations, dreams, or trans in the form of prophecy, or trans dreams, visions that contradict the written word. Now, if you watch, this is instructive. Before John began to talk about all the interactions with the angels and all that, he first of all established the position of the believer. You are loved, you are washed, you are made a king and a priest unto our God. Very important. Now, Paul's words to the church in Galatia is very instructive. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel, that's instructive, from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Even if we are an angel from heaven. That's instructive. Even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached. Let him be accursed. Now, pay attention to the Greek word removed. I marvel that you are so soon removed. The Greek word for removed, it metatemai. It implies to change sides. You have changed sides. It implies to take away from a fixed position. To change sides or to take away from a fixed position. All right? Removed. So, Brother Paul taught believers to be steadfast. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You are so soon removed from him that called you. From a fixed position. You are removed. Meaning you have left where you are supposed to be. And the next thing you will find yourself in is the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage. Once you leave the finished work of Christ. And you begin to romance another gospel. And you begin to double around another gospel. The resultant effect is bondage. The yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Didn't brother Peter call the law of Moses bondage? He said, why put on them a, a yoke? A, a yoke which neither we nor our fathers could bear. Bondage. So brother Paul says to the church in Galatia, the same church, where he said they have been removed. He said, be not entangled again 
with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Notice the sentences. Hath made us. Hath made us. That means that the tenses of the gospel of Christ or the tenses of the grace of God in Christ is what God has done in Christ. What God has done in Christ. Those are the tenses of the gospel of grace. Those are the tenses of the gospel of Christ. What God has done in Christ. Another gospel will try to change it subtly. Another gospel will try to change it softly. Christ plus circumcision. Christ plus obedience. Christ plus, you know, um, dressing. Christ plus and plus seed sowing. Christ plus seed sowing. Or Christ plus tithe. That's another gospel. Anything that adds to what Christ has done is another gospel. It's a pseudo gospel. It's a pseudo gospel. Somebody called my attention yesterday to a video that's trending on social media where a particular man of God says, even if God appears to him and tells him that seed sowing doesn't work, he will tell God, forget it, seed sowing works. Now that's the height of mammonism. We are even God cannot talk to you. We are even God cannot tell you it is not right. That's the height of mammonism. And what he's trying to say is that the word of God supports its sowing. But I've never seen that in the word of God. The only thing the word of God calls seed in the Bible is something you plant in a farmland. It's something you plant in a farmland. Our givings are not seeds. Our giving is generosity. Our giving is liberality. Our giving is in response. We respond to what God has done. It is not our giving that gets God to do something. We give in response to what God has done. So that's why the tenses are important. That you are removed from him that has called you to the grace of Christ. Now when he called you to the grace of Christ, what has he done in the grace of Christ? He hath washed us. He hath loved us. He hath made us. He has made us. He's not going to make us. He hath made us. So another gospel will softly add something to Christ. The word was taken from the Greek word heteros, heteros. It implies strange, different, or altered. Another is a strange gospel or it's an alteration gospel. All right. Then he now said, let that man be accursed. Let him be a cause. The Greek word for a cause is anathema. Anathema implies to ban. Let him be banned. Or let him be excommunicated. Or let him be separated from. Once a man begins to peddle another gospel, let him be excommunicated. Let him be banned. Let him be separated from. Now watch this. Remember, Brother Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven. That means a legitimate minister can teach another gospel. Though we are an angel from heaven. All right? So, which means, Brother Paul was saying, even we, there is a tendency we may preach another gospel. But you have to know which is the gospel to be able to distinguish it from another gospel. Let him be excommunicated let people stay away from him whether he's a man of god or an angel from heaven people are into hero worship hero worship so once a man of god says something even if it contradicts the word of god you are willing to follow the man of god as against the judgment of god's word so your loyalty is not to christ after all your loyalty is to a man but you're only loyal to a man as long as he's loyal to Christ. You'll follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, why are you following me? I don't care how long that man has been preaching the gospel. I don't care how long. He said, no, we are an angel from heaven. That's instructive. That's instructive. That a legitimate minister can suddenly begin to preach another gospel. Some do it out of the love of money. 
love for money and if you pay attention carefully one of the areas where the word of god wants ministers of the gospel is to be careful with money brother paul told timothy the love of money is the root of all evil he was not talking to christians he was talking to a minister of the gospel the book of timothy was written by paul to timothy instructing timothy who was his protege in the ministry and he says to him all man of god flee these things Flee these things. Flee the love of money. Because so many things that have messed up the gospel in this country is as a result of the love of money. Preachers are creating all manner of things to be able to get money into their hands. And so, because of that, the gospel is adulterated. The gospel is corrupted. The gospel is perverted. So, though we are an angel from heaven. Now, that's instructive. An angel from heaven. Let them be banned excommunicated or separated from message vision dream song prophecy revelation that twists the facts of the gospel that twist the facts of the gospel now for you to know which message is twisting the facts of the gospel you must know what the gospel is and what are the facts of the gospel first corinthians 15 3 that christ died that's the first fact of the gospel that Christ died, not that Christ will die. When you confront falsehood and another gospel with the true gospel, the true gospel exposes another gospel. Because the true gospel is light. The true gospel is light. So that's why brother Paul says, though we are an angel from heaven. So whether it's a vision, a dream, a song, you must not tolerate it. You must not be decent about it. You must confront it frontally. It doesn't matter who is peddling it. Any message that twists the facts of the gospel. Christ died, first fact. Second fact, that he was buried. Third fact, that he rose again, not he will rise. He rose again according to the scriptures. Those are the facts of the gospel. That's why the gospel of Christ or the gospel of grace thrives or functions in past tense or if you note the tenses they are tenses that that operate within the confines of what christ has done he has loved us he has washed us he has made us kings and priests unto our god if he's getting clear shout a powerful amen now second corinthians 11 4 for if he that cometh preacheth another jesus preached tenses another jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted take note of the tenses the only way you can know another gospel from the gospel of christ is in the tenses that's why knowledge is important any gospel that is promising you a future in God is another gospel. It's another gospel. Heaven at last is another gospel. It's another gospel. Because the tenses of God's word are always past. That's what Christ has done. The word preached is a Greek word keruso. K-E-R-U-S-S-O. It implies to announce or publish. And then he now says... You might as well bear with them. In Galatians 1, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You might as well bear with them. I need to quickly clarify that word bear with them. Because in English, bear with them means you should put up with them. You should tolerate them. Alright? Is that English? Bear with them is to tolerate them. But in the Greek, that's why I say the Bible is not an English book. So you should be careful when you see English words. In the Greek, you might as well bear with them, is translated from a compound Greek word, anakamai, A-N-A-C-H-A-M-A-I. It implies to hold oneself up against. You hold yourself up against them. It's not to tolerate them. It's not to tolerate them. If you are reading with English mind, you will think the Bible means you should tolerate them. Eh, in the Greek, it actually means to hold yourself up against them. That is, you gather momentum and push them off. You resist them. You confront them frontally. Because another gospel is so subtle that if you stay around it for some time 
and you start managing and you start tolerating, it will start influencing you. That's why somebody who says, well, I follow Dr. Damina on TV. I follow Dr. Damina on Facebook and YouTube. You know, but I still go to my former church. Even though I know they don't have epignosis, but I'm still going there. How do you eat from the table of the Lord and at the same time eat from the table of demons? Are you provoking the Lord to jealousy? You cannot eat from the table of the Lord and eat from the table of demons. Because what you are hearing outside the grace of God and the message of Christ and epignosis is another gospel. It is called the doctrine of demons. And you cannot eat from the table of the finished work of Christ and at the same time be eating from the table where the doctrine of demons is communicating. Are you provoking the Lord to jealousy? You can't hear what I preach and go and hear the opposite at the same time. Say, well, um, I've been in that church for too long. I have built friendship and relationships. It is very difficult for me to leave. Then you don't know what you're looking for. Are you in church for friends or you're in church for Christ? Where's your loyalty? Where's your loyalty? Brother Paul said, even we, if we preach another gospel, you don't owe us loyalty. No, you don't. You don't owe me loyalty. If I come into this house and I begin to peddle another gospel, you don't owe me loyalty. Yes, you will pray for me, but you don't have to stay under me to pray for me. You quit and save your soul. You save your soul from adulteration. That's why I'm teaching you. So nobody will take advantage of you. And you know, I will not. I also I love Jesus. Eating from two tables. It means you have not understood what we're preaching. He said, let him be excommunicated. Let him be cut off. Let him be separated from. Burn him. So now you know that there's another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. So we were dealing with you, man, as well. Bear with them. It means to hold up yourself against them. It implies that there will be a stern opposition against the preaching and teaching and rejection of another gospel. There must be a stern opposition. We must resist another spirit with everything we have. And we must resist another gospel. So take note. The written word, therefore, the gospel is the revelation. The revelation. The written word. The gospel is the revelation. Or the written word remains the basis upon which a vision, utterance, Interaction with angels will be accepted or refused. The word of God is the basis. So all through teachings must affirm the past tense of Jesus' work. And it is upon his finished work that all things derive its legitimacy from. That's why you will see words like Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself... Underline the word gave if your book and Bible is yours. Himself for our sins. Galatians 1 6. From him that called you into the grace of Christ. The word called. Circle it or underline the word called. Gave. Called. The next one. Galatians 2 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Circle or underline the word crucified. Crucified, leave. Another scripture, Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. This only will I learn of you. Received. Circle the word receive. Received ye the spirit. Then another scripture, Galatians 3 3. Having begun, underline the word begun. Having begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. God has sent forth. Circle the word had sent had sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Galatians 5.23 Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. 24 And they that are Christ have crucified. Circle the word crucified the flesh with the affections and laws. So watch the tenses. Gave, called, crucified, received, begun, has sent, have crucified. All 
our past tense. That's the gospel. Hath made us, hath washed us, hath loved us. So Paul said, another gospel that you have not received. Revelation 1, 5 to 6, washed, loved, made us. So in describing what God did in Christ for us, and also the new birth, he uses those tenses. In essence, therefore, every vision, every book, every movie, movie, every testimony, movies like left behind, is another gospel. Movies like the Antichrist is another gospel. It looks like it is acted from the Bible. That's why it's another gospel. It looks like. It looks like. It's another shade. It's an addition to what Christ has done. The humanistic gospel. The gospel of morality. The gospel of character modification. It's another gospel. Motivation and speaking in the church is another gospel. If you're a motivational speaker, you can do it outside for unbelievers. Don't motivate believers. We are naturally motivated. Metula dagaga. That's motivation. Motivation puts the spotlight on me. I'm loaded. I can. And if you think you can, you can. I have it. I got it. You know, that's motivation. But in Christ, I don't have. What I have is what he gave me. That's why it's not the gospel. It's not, motivation is trying to show you what you can do. But I'm dead. I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live. It is not I, but Christ. So the gospel reveals to you what Christ has made out of you. Therefore, in studying the book of Revelation, which has a heavy involvement of angels, heavy, that book, heavy involvement of angels, imageries, and figures of speech. So the test in agreeing with what was seen, what was heard, and what was written by John will be the written word. That will be the test. To accept whatever John saw in that vision or revelation or images or figures will be the written word again, remember, which we have not preached. Which we have not preached. Which we have not accepted. He said you must as well bear with them. You may hold up yourself and sternly resist it. And remember Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven are you following? Remember Paul said those words. And so with those words we can now safely look at Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. This thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 1 again. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, This thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What brother John is seeing in the book of Revelation is things that were passed away. They are things that have already happened. The book of Revelation is a book written about things that have already happened. Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. The word were passed away means it had already happened or it was in existence. So what he saw and had in the vision was already in existence. It was not futuristic. That's why he used the word passed away. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And in his words, the holy city is the new heaven and earth. Now, if you observe, he uses the word Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem sometimes is used figuratively. The word Jerusalem, because we want to uncover that. Figuratively, Galatians 4.26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Which is the mother of us all. That's a figure. Hebrews 12.22. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's figurative. And to an innumerable company of angels. That's figurative. Now, secondly, the word Jerusalem sometimes is also used literally to describe a place. Mark 11.1. 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent it for two of his disciples. They came nigh to Jerusalem, a place, a literal place. Luke 2.25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Luke 2.45. And when they found him not... They turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. So Jerusalem as a metaphor and Jerusalem as a literal. That means anywhere you see Jerusalem, you must find out which Jerusalem. The figure or the literal. So when he says he saw the, the heavenly Jerusalem. Look at it again. Revelation 21.2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband now to understand that john 14 1 let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you the phrase i go means to depart it means or implies to go away or to take a journey I go, I depart, I go away, or I'm traveling. Look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Please underline the word, I go again. And if I go, the first one, I go. The second one, if I go, now, John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than this shall he do. Why? Because I go. If I go, I go. Because I go. Are you following? If I go and prepare a place, I go to prepare a place because I go unto my Father. The reason for going away was for him to come again to them. He went to come. When I go, I will come back. So he went to come. So that where he is, all of us will be. I go to prepare a place. And when I prepare a place, I will come back and receive you that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 16 to 20. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he said him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be where? I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will go, and I will come. But when I come, I am coming as a spirit to live in you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me even when they are not seeing me. Because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 16 and 17 again. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he seared him not, 
neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he visited you. Divine visitation 2018. Divine visitation. He dwelleth in you. Why should I attend a program to hear about a person resident in me visiting me? Another gospel. So when a preacher says, God will visit you. Eh? Another gospel. Why will God who lives in me visit me? So you see, another gospel is very subtle. I mean, what is wrong with a preacher saying, God will visit you? It sounds like good news. But you must understand the facts of the gospel to be able to know that that is not the gospel. Let me tell you, it's not enough to hear me preach to you for 20 years. That is introduction. We need another 50 years. And I'm not joking. Because every day we keep teaching, your eyes keep opening. Is that true? That's why you can never say, I know it after all. Is it? Now, see, see the kind of things we are bringing up from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation that people don't read. People have used padlock to lock it. Whatever is inside, let it be there. As long as I have Jesus, I'm satisfied. Eh -eh. It's not enough. All scripture. All right? So, another gospel gives you a futuristic hope. The gospel of Christ reveals to you what you already have. So when John said, I saw a new Jerusalem. Ah, yeah. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That word, keep my words, means he will believe the gospel. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him. And make our abode with him. We will make him our house. The believer is the abode of the father. The believer is the house of the father. In other words, the believer in Christ is the dwelling place of the father. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, where I am, you will be also. This is what Jesus meant. That the believer will be the house where the father will live in. The believer. Okay? Now, when he said, I will come again to you, what he meant was resurrection. I will rise from the dead. And by my resurrection, you will be my dwelling place. John 4, 23. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship. What it means is, the believer is the place of the Father's worship. Who is in an eternal union with the Father. So when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well, he clearly took her focus from a physical place called Jerusalem. He took her focus from the temple built for worship in Jerusalem. To a spiritual reality. A spiritual reality. A spiritual dwelling or house. Which is the man in Christ. The man in Christ. So the phrase worship in spirit and in truth. Was in reference to a people. The father's household. The new creation. That's why you will hear Paul say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. What Paul is simply saying is, we are the house of God's worship. So the believer is the worship of God in spirit and truth. You didn't hear that. Even without singing, the born again man is a constant worship. Is the house where God dwells. The new creation. Hallelujah. I said the new creation. So the believer is God's temple. The believer is God's house. The believer is God's abode. The believer is God's dwelling place. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? 1 Corinthians 6.17 But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 
verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. When the father said, come sit at my right hand. Come sit at my right hand. Where is the father's right hand? In the believer. Because the believer is God's house. It's called the household of faith. The believer is God's temple. So here the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 23, 24. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. This was not referring to a building in heaven, like the building that was built by Moses. Let me ask you a question, church. The tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Moses, how many divisions did he have? Three. Number one, outer place. Number two, holy place. Number three, holy of holies. How many compartments? You are spirit. Now, so the temple that Jesus entered is not Moses's. It's not the temple built with hands. It's a spiritual temple. And the Bible calls you a spiritual house. Yes, so, where did Jesus enter? Eh? When he said he appeared in heaven for us. Where is heaven? The believer. The believer is God's heaven. I am my father will come into you and make you our abode. So the believer is God's heaven. Where does God live? Exactly. The believer is God's heaven. So Jesus upon his resurrection did not enter into a holy place made with hands. Rather into heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. Can I hear your amen? So the question is, where did he offer his blood? Where did Jesus offer his blood? In Hebrews 9.23, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The word purified was taken from the Greek word katharizo, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-Z-O, which implies to cleanse out or wipe out. The writer of Hebrews also spoke about Jesus purging our sins. In Hebrews 1.3, when he had by himself purged our sins. What did he do after purging our sins? Sat down. Sat down where? So, question, George, from what I taught you. When Jesus purge our sins where did he sit inside us because the believer is the right hand of god or the right hand of god is in the believer so after he purged us what did he do he sat inside us now notice first thing he did was to wipe out our sins and then he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high which is where in the believer. Hebrews 9, 13 to 14. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So now he explains where Jesus offered his blood. Jesus, through the eternal spirit, offered his blood in our hearts. 
the blood was offered in our hearts. What is the mission of the blood? To purge our hearts. So where was the blood offered? In our hearts. He purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So in Hebrews 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God for us. And that appearing in the presence of God for us was referring to the believer. Because the presence of God is in the believer. So, we do not come to the presence of God. We did not come this morning to the presence of God. Father, we are gathered in your presence. No, we didn't come to his presence. We are his presence. So we came with his presence. You're not following me now. The believer is God's presence. Zatolaya. You have to be alert in your heart to catch what I just thought. Zibataka. So the believer is God's dwelling place. Now watch. Hey Taba. I'm wearing a suit, right? I'm wearing a suit, right? Is it a suit? Okay. If I walk before you with this suit, what is this suit? This suit is my presence. This suit I'm wearing is my presence. Why? Because it is with me. You can't see me without seeing it. Because I'm wearing it. So when you see this suit, what have you seen? You have seen me. It's like you say, I saw you. You are the one that took that chair. You say, I swear I'm not. You say, that shirt is the shirt that I saw. If you argue... I didn't see your face, but look at the picture from the back. We have used the shirt to locate you. Because that shirt is you. So since we are God's house, it means you cannot see God without us. So we have automatically become the presence of God. So I do not seek his face. I am his face. Now, religion can't take this. You must grow small to catch this. Say with me, I am God's presence. Remember, I am still trying to unravel the heavenly Jerusalem. And I'm trying to unravel the new heaven and the new earth. And I'm trying to unravel the bride of Christ. So that's why we don't look for his presence. We have his presence. Somebody say, why do we pray? We pray so we can fellowship with him who is joined to us as one spirit. It's fellowship. Okay? And then somebody says, but if we are his presence, why don't we feel him? We don't have to feel. We don't have to feel. We don't feel. We know. We know. It is this teaching that gives you the feeling. When you understand what I'm teaching, the understanding will activate the feeling. Stand on your feet and shout, I am the presence of God. I'm the house of God. Say, I am the right hand of the Father. That means when Jesus says, I go, then he say, I come. You didn't hear what I said. When Jesus said, I go, what did he say again? I come. And the next one, when he says I come, where was he coming to? Coming to the believer. So he was going to come to the believer. The ultimate destination of God's plan, the ultimate destination of Jesus' travel is to arrive in you. In that day you will know that I am in you you are in me and the father is in me. That means we will have an inseparable union. That is, I will never leave nor forsake you. I will abide with you forever. I will abide with you for how long? So when John saw the new Jerusalem, 
When John saw the heavenly city, when John saw the new heaven and earth, what was John seeing? Don't forget what I said in the beginning. That whatever John saw, whatever John saw has to be subjected to doctrine. So that's why I took us from Revelation and I came back to John because John wrote Revelation. So I took us from Revelation and I came back to the doctrinal positions of John to unlock Revelation. The epistles will interpret the revelations of Brother John. See, I hear you. And the good news this morning is your God's presence. You are the right hand of the Father. And you know what the right hand of the Father is? Regency. You know the right hand of the Father is the authority of the Father. The believer is the Father's authority. Zapatolekeya. Somebody shout, I am the authority of the Father. You know what we just said? The Father can do nothing without me. So the Father has to pass through me to exercise his authority. Wave your hands and shout, I am the authority of the Father. Now say, therefore, Satan cannot mess with me. So you see why I'm angry when believers are subjected to rolling on the floor in the name of deliverance? It's making caricature of all that Jesus suffered for, all that Jesus died for. It's making caricature of the eternal purpose of God. How can you take the presence of God and be rolling it on the floor? You are rolling the authority of God on the floor. No wonder I say men that are in authority and don't know they are like the animal that perish. You carry God's presence and you roll on the floor. I changed the song. Demons tremble at your presence. I, I made them sing it somewhere and I told them to sing it. Demons tremble at my presence. When we finished, the pastor said, are you trying, are you trying to take God's, God's glory from him? I said, where is God's glory? Where is God's glory? I am God's glory. I am God's presence. I am the right hand of the Father. I am God's authority. Oh, I am the dwelling place of the Father. I am my Father. will come inside you and we will make our abode in you. Somebody shout, he's with me. He's in me. He's following through me. In me, with me, through me. And he says, I will never leave nor forsake you. So when your body is misbehaving, tell your body, hey, 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 hey. You can't do that in the presence of, in the presence of God there is, where is the presence? So you should have joy all the time. Where is God's presence? What is in God's presence? Fullness of joy. And pleasures where? Where is his right hand? So there should be pleasure. You should be a man of pleasure and a man of fullness, not partial joy, fullness of joy. Every time people look at you, they should see you smiling. Every time people see you, they should see you happy. Why? You are the presence of God. Lift your right hand so heaven. I declare to you today, by the finished work of Christ, enjoy the fullness of God's glory. Enjoy the fullness of all that God is. In the name of Jesus. I decree the remaining days of this week, you will enjoy revelation knowledge. Grow in grace. Grow in knowledge. Abound unto all good things. You are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept by the power of God. You are sustained by the grace of God. The reality of your identity will manifest in this day. In the name of Jesus. Lift your right hand and shout very loud. I am what the word says I am. I am God's house. I am God's temple. I am God's presence. I'm the right hand of the Father. I am the dwelling place of God. God does not visit me. He lives in me. I thought somebody would celebrate that reality. Glory! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, 
then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall walk with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus 1, 12 noon GMT plus 1, 6 p.m. GMT plus 1, and 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you, because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your